throw it off. Yeah. Well, and the stratospheric humidity is like zero. All right. It is time. So we will go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome, everybody, to the November meeting of Palmer Amateur Radio Club. Uh, thank you all for being here, for uh, joining in the pre-meeting rag chew time. I appreciate everybody's uh, time hanging out and chit-chatting. As you see, we have our virtual flag behind me. I'll go ahead and flip this down so that we get the flag. So join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, of America. the republic the for which it stands, one nation one under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. for all. All right. Come back and get my, where'd it go? There we go. Uh, so, uh, Committee reports. I don't see a Tom yet. How about uh, do we have a Glenn? Yep. So, okay, uh, Glenn, go ahead. I'm a, a membership chair for the club, and we currently have 168 members. <clears throat> and we have three uh, new members that recently joined. I believe I saw Jim Weston on here, um, K2VO. And uh, so he's a new member. Uh, Bill Barber, KM6 Delta Kilo Yankee. And uh, I think it's pronounced Pasquale. And uh, call sign is KN6KCJ. And uh, nothing more on the membership side. All right. Great. Thank you, Glenn. And as always, uh, if you have questions about when your membership will lapse, you can check the website or send Glenn an email. He'll be happy to take your money uh, via PayPal um, and go from there. Uh, all right. Mark, any technical updates? Uh, nothing really new to speak of. I've, uh, I've gotten the kit for DMR and we're starting to look at uh, playing with it. Nobody, you know, now that we want another repeater and another of the old repeaters, uh, I can't find any right at the moment, but uh, I'm sure that they'll be back again. So uh, at, everything on the mountain is functioning. Uh, of course, Christine and I were gonna go up there. Uh, at, the plan was last weekend. However, that didn't work out. We had a friend that had a heart attack and uh, ended up dealing with that. So uh, he, he's more better now. Uh, so the plan was to go up this weekend and now they're saying that there may even be snow up there. So Michelle, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it, I'm amazed. I wouldn't think there would be, but. Um, it will, yeah, there won't be any accumulation. There may be some, so there'll be some precipitation and possibly some, some snow at this altitude, but uh, it's not expected to stick. All right, thanks for a little more accurate report. Anyway, so uh, Chris and I will still, we'll go up if we can, and if we can't, we won't. John, do you have anything that you wanted to mention? Oh, the, the only thing is, is that I'm reworking the six meter repeater. I put that in the scope. Uh, the uh, third channel on our SCOM controller took a dump and uh, it died, horrible death. So uh, I'm adding a dedicated single use controller temporarily so that I don't have to make any modifications. And whenever we get the SCOM controller working back again normally, we'll just be able to plug it back in. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Mark and John. Uh, club business. So as you may or may not have seen in the scope, we have a report from our nominating committee, which is Kevin Walsh, KK6FRK, and Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. So uh, Kevin and or Michelle, the floor is yours. All right, I'll jump in. Um, so Michelle and I were around twisting arms and encouraging people to participate in the club. 
our methodology was to seek out people who had joined Park in the last three years. So Glenn gave us a report of people who have joined Park in the last three years, are including really recent people. And so we reached out specifically to those people and some people um, begged off and some people said, yeah, we are glad to help out. So you see in the newsletter that we have a recent member that has agreed to be on the slate for director number two, Chris Steinhardt, uh, KD69LF. And we have Ron Garrison that has agreed for director number one to be on the slate, AJ6, Foxtrot, Quebec. And then for secretary, Jim Collier, W6TQS. And for treasurer, which is a really important position, Tom, WNI, uh, was you know, a real trooper for years and years. So Jim Watson. K2VO is on for the for treasure for this slate. So this means new people uh, with, you know, with new enthusiasms uh, to move forward. Uh, Charlie will remain on as VP and Joe, of course, as president. Michelle and I continue to reach out to people to ask them about committing to things that, that, that are activities that the club hopes to do uh, you know, after COVID. It's gonna be a while. My, my guess is about the time that field day occurs, um, we will have, a, we'll be in a healthier place for COVID. But I'm glad that the club is continuing on and we're using this technology Zoom to, you know, to keep the faith and move forward. So that's a slate. As we, as we are reporting it, that's our report for now. Uh, so next month it will be the vote. So I'm hoping that people um, participate next month and we move forward into 2021 with new people, new ideas and new energy. Uh, I'm gonna um, yield to Michelle W5NYV in case she wants to add any further comments. Over to you, Michelle. Oh, thanks. Sure. Yeah, the uh, the response was excellent. Uh, I've had a large number of conversations with the people that have signed up in the last three years. Um, very positive response. And I'll continue to reach out to the rest of the list. I have yet to talk to everybody. So the uh, uh, different activities that we're going to be recruiting for are uh, an expanded program committee, uh, an events committee, and uh, field day. Start working on, on that now. Back to you. All right, thanks, Michelle. Back to you, Joe. Okay, great. Uh, thank you to our nominating committee. This is some fantastic work. Uh, I'm really excited to have uh, some fresh blood on the uh, um, on the slate and uh, hear what fresh new ideas. Um, the slate, of course, is the the elected officials. There are several appointed uh, P positions as well. So. It's not like we're getting a complete new board. Uh, I'm still on board for the president as uh, Michelle and uh, Kevin said, uh, we saw Charlie and then the appointed positions uh, should be remaining the same with uh, Mark on as the tech chair. And uh, um, yeah, the other uh, uh, Glenn as the membership and then uh, Keith as our scope editor uh, should be maintain uh, those appointed positions as well. Um, if anybody has a, a webmaster experience, uh, I would be thrilled to get that off of my plate, but uh, I'm also able to continue doing that for the time being. Okay, uh, I don't have any other club business specifically. I noticed there were some things in the scope for, uh, uh, for sale items and uh, some other articles that you can uh, peruse at your leisure. Uh, so check those out in the latest scope, which is in your email and or on the website. I have a question. Uh, sure. The scope at palomararc.org, is that how you submit articles still? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, you submitted an article, did that not make it? 
or was um, that last? I've submitted a couple, but I, I haven't ever gotten an acknowledgement after sending them in. Okay. I think last month it, it went in, didn't it? I apologize for not getting a um, acknowledgement back to you, but uh, yeah, that uh, I did see it. Okay. So that, but that's still, that's still the correct address. It is. Yeah. That one, to they, to Keith and it I, made it into last month. It made it. Yeah, so your article was in there last month. That's the only one that I've seen, though. So we'll we'll sync up after and make sure that we're not missing something okay. that didn't get published. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, might have been. A, I, it was an attachment, so it may have, may have been too large. But uh, yeah, just th thanks for clearing up the. Uh, the okay. Yes. Yeah. So scope at palomararc.org goes to Keith, and it also goes to me. Um, I, I get those so that I can make sure that things make it in. Um, and then I also have the ability to go in and look at the spam filters and whatnot. So Michelle, I'll go see if that ended up in a, some sort of filter somewhere that <laughs> didn't make it to our actual inboxes. Um, Cause that goes through Google groups is what we use to disseminate those. Uh, so that for uh, compliance purposes and such, we have a, a record of everything that got sent to the domain. Okay, uh, any other questions, comments for the meeting before we finish out the announcements portion and business? Okay, your board of directors currently is, uh, we have Mark KF6WTN as your repeater site and technical chair. Uh, Keith as your scope editor, Greg as your Drawney directors, John as, uh, sorry, John as secretary, Joe as your, Joe Ashley as your uh, secretary, no, as your director, uh, membership chair, Glenn, treasurer, Tom, vice president, Charlie, and I am your president, Joe, and we will Turn it over now to uh, Bob. I think we saw Bob Heal, yeah, came back online. So Bob, if you're ready, we can turn it over to you and make sure that Mark has enabled screen sharing. Okay, can you hear me okay? Uh, maybe a little bit louder. We can do that. How's that? That's much better. Okay. And I can't believe you can't pronounce my last name. You should own a Heil microphone, don't you? I, don't. Uh, I, I do not own a Heil microphone, unfortunately. Okay. Well, that's my name is Bob Heil. And I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We'll have some fun tonight. And I hope that I can help you learn a few things. And uh, that's what it's all about. I, uh, I love sharing the science of this hobby. Um, I've been in it since 1956. And uh, I love... Uh, I love being with clubs because a lot of times uh, clubs need programming and uh, <clears throat> and the pandemic <laughs> gets pretty crazy. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll get some things happening for you. Let me uh, bring up a couple of things here. And uh, now, where are you guys, most of you? San Diego. Uh, the club is based in San Diego County. And we cover San Diego east a little bit down into northern Mexico a little. Ah, okay. So for us, gotcha. it's on, it's on, not even 8 o'clock yet. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I'm a late nighter, so that's no big deal. And I got all of that from uh, playing around with all my rock and roll deers. <laughs> that was uh, that was fun times. Now, let me get this right thing. I don't have it all here. I started it all earlier. There we are. Okay, yeah. So, we'll, uh, what I like to do before we get into the real uh, serious stuff here, because uh, there's going to be a lot of demos. You'll want to take some notes, things that you're going to learn a little bit about that maybe you haven't heard of, heard of and you should have. Uh, I, I just, I'm really saddened that a lot of the a lot of the things that we need to know is not brought to us. The handbooks are got to be a third degree engineer to, 
to use them and uh, understand them, and it's not fair. So what we're going to do is uh, I do a thing I call the science of audio, but it takes in a lot of different things, uh, more than just audio. <clears throat> but uh, first, we're going to take about 10 minutes and do a little history. I started to and when I was 12 years old, my parents bought me a Hammond organ, a B3. That, that's crazy because they didn't have a lot of money, but mom thought I needed it. I had played accordion before, but I taught myself how to do it by listening to George Wright records and a lot of people down and around San Diego and LA playing in the pizza huts and all that. I, uh, I got a job when I was 14 playing in a restaurant Ended up uh, the next year playing the Fox Theater. I was the substitute organist on that giant Wurlitzer. But what's so important to this and important to you to know is that I learned how to listen. Listening is a mental process. You have to mentally dissect what you're hearing. Most people don't listen. They only hear. That's just a physical. Oh, I heard it. You have to dissect all of the harmonics and things. And in that lower right picture, I, uh, I, I had to help voice and tune those pipes. There's about 5,000 of them in that organ from one inch to 32 foot. And that taught me how to listen. Little did I know later on in life that it was going to be something kind of very special. So we, uh, we gathered on from there and 1956, uh, one of my school chums, uh, he was he just got a, ha a ham radio license. And I said, what, what is that all about? Well, I got my license shortly after. Harvey Wells, you see right there. And Harvey Wells uh, uh, was six meters. Uh, it actually also went to two meters. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, I, I don't think it, uh, <laughs> I don't think you can see it down at the bottom. I need to, it's down right there. But that's a lot of the gear from those days and it's still on the air. I'm on uh, 3885 just about uh, every morning. So I'm, I'm really entrenched into, into AM stuff. I love it. But we got going and I, I was a technician for 17 years. I, I just loved it because we were able to build things. You'll see there the left. I'm sorry I never got a good picture of it, that little blue box. That was my first transmitter that I built. Uh, for, uh, had a 2E26 in it and so on. But the station grew and it grew really quickly. And that white box you see uh, beside the little homebrew transmitter. Uh, that was a Gonset linear. had a pair of 826s. It was the most inefficient amplifier in the world. 300 watts in and maybe 50 or 60 out. Hey, but it was better than the five or six we were able to get out of our Gonset communicators. But um, it, it, this building was so important to me. And um, one day... I'm on six meters, AM, 17 years, by the way. And I heard this ridiculous signal. Now, what is that? I came back the next night and it was there again around the same frequency. So I, oh, there was this button called a BFO and I hit it. Whoa, out of that helicraft just came this voice. It was six meters and it was single sideband. Now, single sideband hadn't even been really uh, going on, on uh, 20 meters yet. So I, uh, I called the guy and I'm scared to death and son of a gun, he came back. And it was, uh, it was a miracle to me because I'm going, wait a minute. Every night we'd meet there and uh, he was so thrilled because nobody else could copy him. They didn't know what was happening. And here's this kid helping him tune that transmitter he was building. And I told him I come into St. Louis three or four times a week to play the organ at the Fox. We played for eight minutes and then we had to wait for two or three hours while the movie went on, you know, things like bridge over to River Kwai. River Kwai. <laughs> so he said, why don't you come and visit me? He gave me the address. And when I pulled up, it was KMOX radio. It's like, whoa. Here I was, this young little kid, trying to figure out what was going on. 
and uh, I, I I went to the to the desk there. The, she, I told the lady I was there to see Larry. She said, well, who is it? We have three of them. I, I don't know. He's a ham radio operator. You know, we don't know light last names. Here comes this man walking out, three-piece suit. He was the chief engineer of CBS St. Louis KMOX. He took me under his wings. And I got to tell you, it, it started a whole generation for me, maybe three or four, the way it's going. And um, I told him that. I said, man, would you build me one of those single sideband transmitters? And he said, no, I, I, I can't do that. I'm like, well, that's kind of crazy. He built him one. But he says, I want to teach you how. And he did. So what we did, I had to build the central electronics 10B first. Those were plug-in coils. We took out the 20 meter coil on that. We put in the six meter. We wound it on a, a grid dip meter, learned how to use a grid dip meter. But then I had to come up with the rest of it. And he taught me how to take a 6U8 and build a 36 megacycle oscillator. So when you put 36 and 14 together, what do you got? Six meters, 50 megacycles. I was just absolutely mesmerized by all of this. And uh, this station really, really kept growing. You'll see that uh, single sideband station down on the left side. And um, then by then the uh, NC300 came about brand new on the air. And uh, it was just crazy stuff, just crazy. So I, uh, I continued on. I, I had these loving parents that allowed me at 17, 18 years old to put up a 120, uh, 110 foot roan with a Telerex 36 foot long Telerex six meter array. And that six meter array was their spiral array. I was fascinated by this. Like what's going on here? Well, you see, that was the beginning of Bob Heil really understanding what was going on in that antennas, Yaggies are either horizontal or vertical. And what I learned was when you hear a signal come to you and it fades down, you're thinking, well, the signal just got weak. No, the signal didn't get weak. It changed polarity. Sometimes there's 20 or 30 dB between cross polarization. And so when you do that, you're gonna lose a lot of signal, but it'll come back. Well, Telerex thought they would make an antenna that kind of helped it, and it did. It was amazing. I put that baby up, up on top of this 110 foot roan, and I had a 432, uh, 30, uh, 28 elements up there. I didn't care for that much. I was more into six and two meters. So things really started rolling and the station was just going crazy. And then I took a pair of their two meter antennas, 50, uh, there was uh, 15 elements on two, one vertical and I put one horizontal and I phased them. And I could do some really incredible things. And I'm going, whoa, it's all about this phasing. Well, I become an addict of phasing. And we're going to really get into this in a while. You're going to learn and hear the demo. And most people don't understand. They hear, oh, yeah, it's phasing. We're going to really get into it. A couple more minutes here, though. I, uh, I wanted more power, so I built a six and two Thunderbolt, a kilowatt and a half. You'll see that uh, central electronics up above my head for the exciter. I was just going crazy. And, and again, um, I didn't realize what was happening until one day I talked to one of the ARRL officials. I was only one of the first 10 in the world on single sideband on six and two meters with a kilowatt. But it was Larry Burrell's coaching me all through all this. And uh, one day I got a call from Bob Drake. Whoa. Of the Drake company. He said, are you the guy that's got that kilowatt on six meter sideband? And I said, yes, sir. He said, we tracked you down and uh, I want to invite you to our club meeting. We do it once a year. We bring in technical people and we want you to come and tell us what you did, how you did it and all that. And so one of my friends and 
back in my hometown of Marissa, Illinois. That's 50 miles southeast of St. Louis. I used to talk to him on two meters all the time. He had a Bonanza air, well, airplane. He said, I, I've heard about this meeting. I'd like to go. So he flew me out there. And when we got there, it was the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Dayton. Once a year, they would hold meetings, technical meetings. They'd take all the furniture out of one of the floors. One of the rooms was the Collins room, the Hallicrafter room, Central Electronics room, the, the Mosley room, the Telerex room, all of this kind of thing. And these people were there, not to me. Oh, my goodness. They were like movie stars. I was reading about them in the magazine. I'm an 18, 19-year-old kid going crazy getting to meet these people. And I had a guy come up to me from the UK and he said, we are looking for someone like you. He said, we, we're an antenna company. We're the J-Beam Antenna Company. And we need somebody with a lot of power on two meters. Would you mind doing a test with us and putting this up? Hey, no, it was not my vocabulary. My parents, or as I told you, were loving to let me do anything. In a spare lot beside our house that had the 110 footer, we put up this one. It was 128 elements on two meters. And um, I got to tell you, after I got through with all of that, oh my goodness, uh, the, the world changed for me, changed in a much better way. It was uh, 50 foot wide and 50 foot high, 128 elements, two meters. And I, I just had so much fun with this. Uh, the, uh, the signals that I could produce was pretty crazy. It had a gain of about 24 dB. <laughs> you, dump, you dump a kilowatt and a half into that. Yeah. So things really, really got going. I was just building things like crazy. But remember... I still had a job. I was playing the organ at least four to five nights a week at the Fox. I also then got a job at a four-star restaurant. And that middle picture, I built that instrument. It's a three-manual B3. B3 has only had two. And all these instruments you see were operated with solenoids from a pinball machine. And they all were operated from the keyboard, the piano, a real piano, the marimbas, xylophones, all that stuff. And there again, who, who could best do that but a ham? <laughs> and I was still voicing and tuning all that crazy stuff. So I, I really had fun. But I, um, I got tired of playing after all those years. And I started this little music shop in Marissa, Illinois. My parents had a men's ready to wear and shoe store. In fact, you look at that picture. That was my dad out hanging out the door waving. I didn't know that till I, years after I was looking at that picture. Ye old music shop became a very important part to the rock and roll scene. And you're looking at a guy that has never tasted beer. I have never smoked a cigarette and I'm dealing with a drug addict. So it's like, what? But they respected me for my soldering iron. The thing that I started with all of them was I, I started taking Hammond organs apart. I was really in tune with Hammond organs, of course. And I was the first guy to cut them in half so that instead of them weighing 300 pounds, they weighed about 100, 100 and a half. So uh, still some of them out there, you'll see once in a while, B3 legs on it. And I, uh, I had so much fun playing things like that. Well, one day I get a call from Fox Theater, the stage manager used to bring the organ up and down to the pit when I was playing there. He said, hey, you, you need to come by here. We're throwing out our old PA uh, from the screen, our sound system, and maybe you want them. I get up there and what I see sitting in the alley were those two boxes on the left. They were Olsen bins. There were four of them. This is just one side. I brought them back to Marissa. I had a friend of mine who had a fiberglass shop, and we made those fiberglass radial horns, put some JBL drivers on them, and I built this PA. Now, I didn't know anything about what was going on in the rock and roll world because I really wasn't into all their kind of music, but I was renting Hammond organs to the Keel Auditorium, 19,000 seats in St. Louis. And uh, I took it up there 
the PA up there one weekend when I was renting them a Hammond organ and it started an avalanche. I didn't know that I was the only one that had been doing this. I figured there would have been others. And very quickly, these are the kind of people that were on that stage, Buck Owens, Jerry Lee Lewis, and yes, a young Dolly Parton in 1968. Down at the bottom was Joe Walsh. His manager came to me and he said, hey, we got this little group in Ohio and uh, they're getting started on a tour. We need some sound. Would you do it for us? And so, yeah, I hadn't been on a tour yet, but we did that. About two shows uh, into that tour, Joe and I decided we were discovered we were hams and uh, away we went. I get a call in 1970 from the Fox and he said, hey, Heil, you still have those speakers? And I said, I do. He said, talk to this guy. This band came in here at four o'clock today and none of their gear showed up, just had their amplifiers. The story is, and it's a piece of rock and roll history. You can read about it. Well, it's well defined. This group was going to do a very short tour and they were on probation, the sound man was on probation out of the state of California. He wasn't supposed to be out. And they kind of snuck under the radar. They went to New Orleans the first night in the tour. But the FBI and the DEA heard about it, sat in the back row. The band after the show came on to St. Louis. No cell phones or anything. When Owsley loaded the truck, the FBI and the DEA padlocked him and off he went. Here comes four o'clock the next day. They get on the stage. What's happening? They call back and found out he's in jail. So the stage manager says, here, call this guy. He's got a big PA. He handed the phone to one Jerry Garcia. Jerry was really freaked out because I had Macintosh amps, JBL speakers, and then Olsen bins, all these kind of things. He said, you get that up here right away. And so we did. You can go into Google and put this sentence, the night rock and roll sound was born. It was a piece of history in rock music. Of course, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize what was happening. How did I? We uh, did that little tour and all heck broke loose. Everybody was calling us because we hit the front page of Billboard magazine that we ended up with the Grateful Dead tour. And they were coming to me like crazy. And we're talking about everybody from Beach Boys to Humble Pie and the guy up in the top left. These guys all became very good, close friends of mine. Check that out. On Humble Pie. Check out that picture because it's going to mean something later on. Who do you think that is on the left? He's kind of sitting on the curb. It's none other than Peter Frampton. He played lead for them for a while and then he broke out and did his own. And uh, here again, I, if I couldn't be friends with them, I wouldn't work with them because I'm a straight man in a crazy world. They respected me because of my soldering iron. Pete Townsend always put it cool. He said, leave the guy alone. He doesn't do any drugs or crap. And he's got a soldering iron and makes it sound good. And he can drive the truck. And I did. <laughs> Going to show you a picture. Who is that? Nobody ever, ever guesses it. It was their first tour. I was hired to do that. We're still working with them doing their microphones today. That happens to be Billy Gibbons. Yep. The one and only. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I have so much fun with these guys. And of course, they're, uh, they've, they've grown their beards a little longer. <laughs> oh, gosh. My life's been so full of stuff like that. But I get this call from a guy and he said, hey, are you, you, you the guy that's got that big PA, right? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I need it tomorrow in Boston. I said, that can't happen. Why not? I said, so we're on tour with Chaka Khan in Chicago and I can't, I can't make it. Well, no, he said, you, you got to be here. I said, well, wait a minute. Who are you? He said, we're the who? I said, no, who are you? He said, we are the who. <laughs> Dumb me. Well, 
what we did, um, got somebody to take the, the uh, Chaka Khan dates, went to the airport, got into a flying tiger, drove our 40 foot semi in and away we went to Boston and it was to who they hadn't been here in about four years and things had gotten really righteous and sound when they came here then it was just little bitty columns they brought those over here and the first night of that tour was a disaster nobody could hear them and from that day forward we were with them for six years and it was it was, it was really fun and then I, I, I've, I started a plant and we started building things. Only began again, you're going to hear this all night. Ham radio was at the forefront of me building power amplifiers and mixers. They were modular. Nobody had ever done that and haven't since. If, if you had a, a mixer like that and channel six went out, you're dead. No, nope. you carried a spare with you that we gave you when you purchased the mixer. Same thing with the power amps. We're building studio mixers and all of that. And uh, we had a, quite a crew. We had our own fiberglass shop. And there were uh, 35 people working in our plant building all of these wonderful sound systems. One day I get a call from Paul Klipsch. Here starts the good stuff. Get out your pencil and paper. Paul Klipsch, the father of hi-fi, the father of the whole folded horn. Hey, that you, Heil? And I said, yes, sir. Who's this? This is Eclipse. I'm going, this is Eclipse. This is God on the other side of this phone. Oh, my gosh. And he wanted to come and see me. So he flew his airplane up to Marissa, Illinois from Hope, Arkansas. And all day long, I figured, he's going to cut me off at the knees. Not at all. He's about this tall over me. And he, what do you do that for? How come? How'd you learn that? Where'd you get that? Ham radio, huh? Where'd you get that? Took me back to his home, Hope, Arkansas, the next day. And oh, man. It was really incredible what I learned in his lab. You see there with him with this plexiglass model of his K horn in that building. The building was an original uh, telephone exchange building in Hope, Arkansas, in 1941. And uh, it's just amazing what Paul Klipsch taught me. Because there again, he respected what I was doing and he knew I didn't really understand it and he was going to be my teacher and he did this is where we start trying to show you and explain to you what's so important about audio he guided me to the studies of the bell labs referring to it as the idea factory of the 1920s bell labs was a consolidation of a at&t and western electric which was the manufacturing arm of the bell system Check this out, ladies and gentlemen. There were 4,000 scientists and engineers assigned to that newly created Bell Telephone Labs. My gracious, think about this. But what they found was amazing. They researched how our ears worked. I said how our ears worked and what frequencies were most important to understand the spoken word. You can't just slap it all out there. Our ears are very, very much in tune to what we need to hear. And nobody, nobody ever talked to me about that before. I mean, I, how did I know? And I was, I had been then getting into the home theater business. We actually were kind of uh, originators of the home theater business. Uh, because of my ham radio again, I was very big player in the home TV RO system because another friend of mine, W5KHT, Bob Cooper, down in Oklahoma City, he and I used to do moon bounce with that 125 element guy. Well, I saw one night on television, he was on a, t a late night TV show and he had his six foot dish. And I go, wait a minute. I, I recognize him, but then what is he doing? Well, he had taken a satellite dish from the surplus that he got. And he took an LNA, a can from a Folgers coffee and built an LNA in it. And he would hold classes in his backyard in Oklahoma City once a month. 
and teach us how to do that. I would go down there. And so we started doing uh, home satellite stuff way before it was ever a hot dog. This was back in 78, 79. I folded my, uh, my whole career of the, uh, of the sound reinforcement. The punk rock came in and it wasn't good to deal with these people. So I said, see you later. And we went crazy. We put a thousand of these dishes throughout Southern Illinois and Missouri. But um, at, uh, at one of the shows, I got a guy come to me and he said, hey, we want you to be a part of a test we're doing. We bought the rights to the first K-band satellite. And instead of them being 10, 8 or 10 foot, we're going to be four times higher the dish can be four times smaller. And I was on the test team for direct TV for about six years. There were 10 of us across the country. Again, they picked me because of my ham radio background and all of the craziness that I'd gotten about that 128 elements. <laughs> but again, it's ham radio. What you see on the left was the vice president of RCA. And uh, they brought the first original direct TV and we put it into the home in, in a suburb of St. Louis. It was the first time one had been installed in a home. We were the first dealer. And what you see to the right is actually has turned into our, the front end of our plant today where we build microphones. We did a lot of stuff and kept building behind it, 7,000 foot <laughs> behind it. But anyway, we were huge into satellite and then into the home theater stuff. We were doing monster things, two and three hundred thousand dollar rooms. And it was it was remarkable. But there again, I learned how to listen and I could apply it. I wasn't gonna put up the satellite system and listen in two two little three inch speakers. And so I uh I had a guy working for me that uh, he was just coming out of the University of Illinois, and he didn't have a job for a few months. And it was Tomlinson Holman. Tomlinson Holman was the creator of THX for George Lucas. After he left me, of course. <laughs> but in uh, ensuing years, he had me come out and we, we helped teach uh, other people about this home theater stuff, and especially his audio, which his audio was amazing. And um, at one of the shows, they used to hire me to bring my home theater rooms to the CES and all that. Ray Dolby shows up and, and, and introduces himself. And I said, I, I have a, he said, I, I have a prototype of my, my audio box. We call it ProLogic. Would you like to use it? And for the first time, people that attended that CES showed it set in my one of my theaters could hear sound, surround sound, four channel, left, right, center, rears. You're going to learn in just a few minutes how that happens because it all happens because of something we do in amateur radio every day. It went on to really go crazy. I mean to tell you, people would come to me. I had a lady come and said, oh, you do all these rooms. What could you do with my basement and my 100-year-old house? I said, that's not a problem. That's what we did to it. What behind the curtains was that junky little room. That's where we put the equipment. We did all kinds of things. We took that room and turned it into that 100-foot screen that rolled out of the ceiling. Yeah. And I came back after 12 years to amateur radio and I'm going what happened what happened to my great Art Collins audio holy smokes I couldn't believe it everybody I just couldn't believe it and so I started uh, getting on the air talking to some of these guys I have to make a change in a microphone here we're gonna play no games we unplug this This isn't a magic act. Now, I'm going to have to raise the gain because the green in this thing goes crazy. 
And uh, there we go. Okay. Somewhere along in there. And it's like, what happened? What happened to this audio? And the only answer I would get would be, well, um, I got a matching microphone when I bought my Kenwood. Really? Yeah, it's matching. Well, I got news for everyone. The only thing matching is it's painted the same color. It certainly wasn't anything that followed what AT&T, Bell Labs, Paul Klipsch, and everybody knew. We have to have certain syllables work for us. Let me plug this back, take this off. Plug the other one back in. And it just got to the point, got to the point, let me turn on my monitor because I'm going to need that here. Turn off my subwoofer. We're not playing music. <laughs> it got to the point where I just went berserk when I'd get on the air. These guys and their matching microphones because they didn't have any articulation. Let me show you. Let me let you hear what happens when you have no articulation. There's a microphone that's flat. Sounds like that thing. Well, what AT&T, Bell Labs, all those scientists discovered is our ears must have a rise from two to three K to understand the F and an S and a P and a D. What I'm gonna do now, I'm only touching one button. I'm bringing up 2.5K. How cool. Let me turn it off. 2.5K is going away. There's what most guys sound like because they don't use any EQ and their rigs aren't, and there you go. And the microphones are terrible. It got me to thinking, wait a minute. And so what I did is I built amateur radios first, equalization. It hadn't been done yet. We built the EQ200. It was a little box that had a bass treble, a bass and a treble control. No one had ever been doing this. I didn't know that because I hadn't been in the hobby very long at that time. I'd been out for 12 years. And so I built this little box and I wrote an article in QST, July of 1982. And it got the cover award. And I'm going, whoa, that's pretty crazy. How honorable. And there it is. Very simple. But it backfired on me. People didn't want to build it. <laughs> that was a build it a DIY uh, article, right? They didn't, want, they didn't want to talk about it. They wanted me to build it. <laughs> oh, okay. So we uh, hired some of our gals back. The plant had been closed for two years. So we uh, got back and started building EQ200s, which opened my amateur radio division. And so away we went. It was, it was something that I really, really love doing is helping people. I had done it in the rock and roll world, and here I was at my first love of ham radio. But it all starts at the microphone. Just because the dang thing is the same color or was packed in the same box, that doesn't make it. Because what happened is a lot of them, really high-priced quality radios, have these things. Well, it's okay, Hyle. It's matching. It came in the box. got to be good. Really? I'm going to unplug this microphone again. And the problem is that these microphones are kind of hollow sounding. This one isn't because I got rid of it. How did I do that? It doesn't sound like a hand microphone. Let me get something here. Ooh, I got to bring the gain up a bit. It doesn't sound like that because I did one important thing. When you put a microphone element in a clamshell, this is what you get. This is what you get. This is what you sound like. 
And you're going to say, well, Bill said I sound fine. Yeah, but it sounds like a tin box. This one does not. How'd I do that? I opened it. focus on it. Anyway, I put a grill in the top. So it detuned that cavity. And it's the best darn hand microphone you'll ever hear. And it's not very expensive. So I just, I moved on from there. I said, we have got to do something. And, and one of the things that I do, let me plug this back. We have about three times the gain, of course, with this job. This is a PR35, which has been the microphone for many, many entertainers from Carrie Underwood to Charlie Daniels, the late Charlie Daniels. We built this for Charlie. He was a great American. We have a custom shop. We do all these for, for many people. When my guys were building this for Charlie, I said, build me one, too. So that's how I got this one. But anyway. You have to you you have to be able to you know how to use a microphone. That's another thing. I hear people they're three feet from their microphone, and it's like, what is going on here? It's terrible sounding. Why? Well, then I start investigating, <laughs> and I discover what's going on. Their uh, desk stand is uh, way out here, and. Uh, they turn up the gain. Well, Bill said a sound is fine. I'll just turn up the gain with you, buddy. There you go. I just turn that up. Ain't great? No, you sound like you're in a gymnasium. And it really makes me feel sad because they nobody has ever told them about this. So what you have to do is educate. That's why I do these things to help people. The other thing you never want to forget especially with very good microphones, is use a windsock. And I'm not talking about going down to Walmart. This is a very special windsock. comes with all of our microphones. It's acoustically transparent. I hear guys every once in a while, hey, you put that sock thing on it and your audio changes. If it does, you got the wrong windscreen. And it really bothers me because People don't think about that. Oh, it's a windscreen. No, no, they are not all the same. And so you have to pay attention because they, uh, they do cause things to go crazy. I built the uh, PR781 primarily for some of the better rigs today, like the Flexes, the Flex sells the 781 as part of their matching microphone. And it's really, really good. And uh, it, it's one of those things that has all the attributes of the PR40. And uh, you're going to ask, what is a PR40? Hmm. Well, you remember what I told you a while ago about learning a bunch of things. It's time. So if you haven't learned anything and you're kind of sleeping along, I don't think you're going to do don't have any security now. markings on them. Karen. Do what? Somebody have a comment? Somebody said something. I thought they were talking to me. Here we go. I'm going to change this. We're going to learn several things right now. This is a PR22. This is a microphone that I built at the uh, invitation of Paul Rogers of Bad Company. He wanted a microphone that had really good articulation in that 2.5 range, but he didn't have to worry about his, his audio guy because these audio guys didn't understand what to do sometimes. Oh, come on here. So I want a microphone that when I plug it in, it sounds great. This has no, I, no EQ, it's flat, so everybody's happy. Well, here we go. Now, I'm going to take a little sidestep here for a minute. If you were running 500 watts and you weren't making it through the pileups, huh, how about getting a kilowatt? Yeah? Okay, I will. i buy me a kilowatt, a couple thousand dollars maybe. Mm, okay. So you get yourself a kilowatt. You've doubled your power. How many decibel will you raise your signal? 
three, not 15, not 20, three, one, two, three. This is science. I didn't make this up. It's the way it goes. So if you double your power, the receiver is only going to see 3 dB, unless you're doing other things. Well, if I bring both of these microphones up here, I'm going to double my power, and you're going to hear the difference. Here we go. Gets pretty loud because it's going to be a kilowatt, right? Same deal. One, two, three. What? Wait a minute. Remember what I told you about listening? Mentally listening? Do me a favor. Close your eyes. Please. Let's get real calm. Close your eyes. Because on the count of three, I'm going to take away a whole lot of power. 3 dB. Double your power. Here we go. One. Two, three. Huh. You see, the human being cannot discern. We can't discern 3 dB. Oh, maybe in an, an echo chamber, you know, a million dollar room that's treated and all of that. We're talking the normal ham shack. You can't. So you wasted your money. Let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you what to do. It, it probably cost you a couple of thousand. Take that couple of thou, give it to your wife, and let her buy some more shoes and purchase. Now, I'm telling you, when she comes home with that, you really did something. Because it ain't going to help you with that kilowatt amplifier other than your ego. I'm running a kilowatt. Okay. Now, check this out. Just check this out. You see, I can get you at least 10 dB. Remember that little box I showed you? Well, if you could add 2.5K, listen to this. We're going to add about 10 decibel just by changing equalization. You see, it can all be done with audio EQ. Hmm. Here's another thing while I have these, and this is really why I do this, this part of it. You know, we talk about phasing. A lot of people don't understand what it really is. But you're about to learn how important phasing is to what we do. I have two microphones. They're both the same. One's a different color. But now, instead of my Y cord going direct, I have this little bitty cable connector. And that adapter is backwards. Pin two is to three and three is to two. This microphone is out of phase. Oh, big deal, Hyle. That sounds just like this one. Really? Not when I talk into both of them because this element is this element is going down when I talk. This element is coming up. When you put them together, they cancel and nothing happens. They're still working, but not together. Oh, I wish we had a couple of hours. It's my favorite subject. My favorite subject. Because nobody, I don't know what happens. You don't hear about these things. You hear, I don't know what sometimes you hear about. It's really crazy. But let's look at this whole deal. I'm going to get rid of one of these so it's not so cumbersome. How does phasing work? How, how does it happen? Well, it's pretty simple. How did Wes Shum, it wasn't Art Collins, how did Wes Shum in 1948 delete the carrier when he developed single sideband? How did the other sideband get deleted? How does your notch filter work when somebody rolls up on top of you in a QSO? You push a button and he goes away. How does that work? The notch filter takes him out of phase and he's gone. How does the Yagi work? How, was, how didn't Dr. Yagi know to build it that way? Noise canceling headsets. How does the equalization filters, how do they work? Well, th there's, there's a case in point with Dr. Yagi. He didn't have a computer. 
He just figured it out. He figured out if he went out on a boom so far and it was so big, he could have a little gain. If he went behind, he could, ah, it was out of phase. So he could have rejection. And, and it's just, it just goes on and on and on. I had a great experiment. I lived down in the Ozark, had a second home down there for a while. I think you're going to really enjoy the next couple of minutes. Here's a video that I did of how important phased arrays are. And, and, and like me, I'm sure you're saying, well, oh my gosh, probably cost a thousand dollars. No, it cost me about $23 and it'll cost you that just to coil a wire. Here is a great treatise on an antenna that you should have in your yard. The installation of a 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line of 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried. And just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof. But that's the way we get to switch all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I, mine's usually three inches or so. It, you know, that's just after I get done mowing it. And uh, I know, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm, I'm going to have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it because, you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing in it at all, it's looking right, it gets looking right good pretty quick. So uh, it's, uh, it's to that point now. And uh, the system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher. But in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. Yeah, well, I see they introduced big display on it and uh I think you uh, might have learned a few things there. So much you can do with a coil of wire if it's the right length and all that. And the phasing, phasing is the big part of it. Some years ago, 2006, Joe Wall sent me down. We were, we lived in California for a number of years, a second home again. And the, Joe said, you need to build me a better microphone. And so we, we started talking and he said, I don't want things that I got to stick right in the front of my mouth all the time, as you see so many. He said, I want to move around a little bit, and I, I, I think you can help me. Remember that big antenna you had? Man, that thing was something. When you turned that around, I couldn't hear you. I'd come through there on the bus, and we'd get on two meters. Wow. Well, huh, hello. It's all about rejection. Just build me a microphone like that. And so I did. And what I did is I came up with a PR-40, which is now become one of the darlings of the broadcast industry. I just turned on Ellen this afternoon and Bon Jovi was on there and they all had high microphones. Wonder why. 
all the old things are 60, 70 years old and they're, they're, they're that old. There's new technology and ham radio brought it to me that I could do this because of my phasing elements. Trust me on this. So why can't we do it in a microphone? So what I did was this. Every microphone out there, you know, all these little ball things, it's almost 100 years old now. They have four little holes around the top of the element. So three o'clock, 12 o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock. There's four little holes. That was, that's the entrance for the rear rejection information. And then it would be out of phase. I said, that's nonsense. So what I did, first of all, we were the first company to be able to successfully build a large diaphragm that worked. And then the diaphragm is an inch, inch and a half. I mean, these are big things. Nobody had ever done that. And we opened the whole bottom of the element, not just three little holes. I put it on a, uh, I call this collection tube inside the microphone. And now up through the side of it comes all these different frequencies and they are out of phase. Bingo. And so now, not only can we have a front position that'll go 180 degrees and you never know it's changing. You don't have to be stuck right here. That's why broadcasters love it. But when I get behind the phasing plug, goodbye, it's gone. 40 dB. Oh, it still works. It's 40 dB down. No other microphone in the world will do that. All because of ham radio, phased arrays. All the stuff I learned from ham radio, I can do these really incredible things. And, and it really makes me sad when we don't get to hear a lot about some of this. Because uh, so many people think, oh, well, we got everything flat. No, you can't. If you have a flat response, it doesn't play to the needs of the human ear. You have to have a rise at 2.5K. And I prove it to you. I'm going to do this again because I always have that there. We'll do that there and we'll do that there. Now, this microphone has a rise in it. So I want to chop it out so that it's flat. There is a flat microphone. You pick up an RE20 or you pick up a Shure or a, I don't care what it is. That's what they sound like. Kind of lifeless. Well, um, I'm going to take this one and put it back to flat. I cut it out of there. But we have such wonderful mid-range. But if you can increase that, if you have an equalizer in your transmitter, it gets even better. Listen to it. Isn't that sweet? You can hear the F and the S and the P and the B. It's so important when you're in a pileup. What happened was Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson, they put on the... Uh, on the, on the chore here to figure out why our ears were so crazy. And here's what they found. They're not flat. And as we go up in level, as you get up to 100 dB plus, it's kind of flat. Down here at 20, 30 dB where we mostly listen, my goodness, it's like a ride at Disneyland. And so what you want to do is you want to get rid of the lows. The lows do not help. You don't believe me? Well, here, if I do that, it, it covers up the F's and the F's, the S's and the P's and the B's. It, it muddies everything up. Get rid of it. And when you do that, bingo. Now, what's so important about that is what it's doing to your RF signal. Because as you probably know, your RF signal is really guided by the audio you put to it. Here's a great demo of what happens. Here is your signal with the, all the low ends down here and all it's there. But if you narrow that up, this is the, these are the gates. If you narrow that up, roll off that last 50 cycles or 80 cycles, what happens? You still have the same RF, but where's it going? 2.5K centered. You just heard a great demonstration of how important 2.5 is. Because if you try to fill out the whole thing, 
you lost the articulation. And unless you're 40 dB over nine, they're not going to hear you so well. And so we have to make sure that we're putting all of the emphasis around that two to three K. And what's so important about all this is in 1999, got a letter from Dr. Inouye, Dr. Holmes Icom, right? And he had one of my EQ 200s and my Goldline microphone. And I'm going, whoa. Thinking of new radio line, I want to use your equalizer. So we started working with them. Not that they couldn't do it, but it was already proven and they came to me and away we went. Every ICOM from Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, all the way through to the 7600, 7610, 73, they all have my equalizer, bass and treble. And so for all the guys that say, and I ask him, how many people still have their radios in the default mode? <laughs> Usually it's about 80, 90%. And that's really sad because the manufacturers have not helped us because they really don't know. They really don't. So it was up to us. And uh, here's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna bring this all back. And here's what happens if you don't do the proper equalization, the F's and the F's and the P's and the B's are lost because of your ears. They're screaming to hear that. So you go into your ICOM and you grab the treble. I've already set it at 2.5. You don't have to set that frequency. It automatically comes up. You just bring up the level. And on the low end, if you want a little low or if you want to notch it all out, you can do that. If you're working DX, that's exactly what you want to do. Roll off that low end. Increase that mid-range. Because you only got two, uh, 3K to, to deal with. And so it makes a lot of sense. And we build microphone elements that help you. The DX world is very much in tune. Most all of the DX expeditions since 1985 have relied upon Heil Sound because of our HC 4s, 5s, and now it's called the HC 7s. Because we automatically do that for you. We don't need all that low end when we're in a contest. And that's, it's, I, I have guys there every once in a while, oh, that dumb oil, I build those stupid sounding microphones. No, they're not stupid. They put all that power, man. All that power goes up there. It doesn't end up down here. It's all up there. And so it's, it's all about the science of audio in your ears that we learn from the Bell Labs. And the HC7 is your magic number. We built that in the Pro 7. The Pro 7 headset has been out now many years. It's the number one headset. Don't believe me, look at all the, all the articles in the QST and CQ and they're, they're using our headsets. A lot of features about it. First of all, from Paul Clips, I learned how to tune a cavity, the speaker. The speaker sits back here. So we're, it's that far away from your ear. So guys with, uh, head, uh, with earpieces, it doesn't feed back. Because if you have a speaker on all other headsets, it's right here and it'll feed back. Doesn't do that here. We also have a left to right. So if you're hard of hearing one side or the other. And the micro microphone elements are interchangeable. We need a special microphone element for all ICOMs. They have very low gain. So we make a very special IC element. Almost spells ICOM. And that plugs into it. The dynamic is fine for a Yesu and Kenwood. The other thing about it is something no other headset in the world has, and all of ours have for the past 10 years. What? Phase reversal? What's wrong? What is that about? You go into a pile up and you hear this little weaky guy back here, reverse the phase and you can bring him up front. You can move signals around in your head, move the acoustical signal by changing the phasing. 
I learned it all from ham radio. I learned it all from antennas. Why doesn't everybody do this? Because most of the engineers that these guys hired over the years weren't a ham. One other thing I did, I put a connector on it. So if you do a multi-multi, you plug another headset in the monitor. And last but not least, I read AHAM every day. Because if I see a bad review, there's no excuse for a bad review of my product. Every one of those products I design, I've tested, I know what they do on what radios. The problem is they'll put the wrong thing into the wrong radio, the wrong connector. God bless them. And then they'll say, oh, the Ohio headset is so uncomfortable. No, it's not. I build every headset with a steel band in it. And if you need it bigger, don't worry, you're not going to break it. So if you have a big wide head or if you have a pinhead like me, adjust them. It's very simple. And that goes for all of our headsets. This is a really great headset I build just for the communications of all kinds of uh, communications and emergencies and stuff. And you can even see the stainless steel in this one and you can adjust that. This is a marvelous headset, the BM-17. Not expensive, but oh man, it's a good. And I don't know how many requests that I used to get. Why don't you do something for handy talkies? Because the handy talkies cheapo microphone things are terrible. So I did. And it's still inexpensive, but God, is it great. Whoa, it sounds so good. And it's lightweight. So the guys doing backpacking and all of the, uh, the outdoor things and so on. Here you go, right here. It's called the HTH. And of course we make them for all the different plugs. That's always a problem. But you know, we're, we're, we're just constantly bringing you these things that you don't read about. And that's what disturbs me is there are so many things that we could be talking about. And we only have a short time here. You come back and we can talk about power focus. You probably never heard about power focus. The patterns, and we prove all this stuff for you. And uh, getting into adjusting the radios, I got a really good uh, thing on that, but we just don't have enough time to cover it all. <laughs> but I wanted to, to touch on a few things. I got one other thing I want to show you before we get out of here. All people talk about is the transmitter. What about the receiver? Well, I got a. I don't care what it is. I'm not going to pick on any one thing. <laughs> Let's see. I think you'll be. Yeah, you'll be able to see this little gadget. The problem is that nobody, and I mean nobody, has ever taken any choice to help us with receivers, and. Again, it's one of those things, let me turn this on, one of those things that, why are they not listening? What, what's the problem here? And that's what bugs me is the, okay. Let's see what we can hear. What we're going to do, first of all, let me tell you this. There's a high filter, and there's, oh, I'll turn that down. There's a high filter at 6K, plus or minus. There's a low filter. Where is it? 160 hertz. So I can roll off that darn low end. And the parametric. These are just shelving, plus or minus. But, and I selected the frequencies after many years. But the middle one is parametric. What's that mean, Heil? It means you are the engineer. And you can change the parameters and we can change the frequency. And so what you're going to hear is uh, this came off air, by the way. I, I recorded them. We have, uh, we have two, two headphone outputs so you can have monitor, operator, or left and right. And that's a record out. That's how I recorded these with, with that. Now, here we go. Let me uh, get this all set up. Make sure that's all flat. Okie doke. This is very compelling. You can't argue with it. We all need it because we're getting old. Check out this DX signal. 
without EQ. Listen to him come out. Here comes two point five. India is Bravo Lima Bravo. We're gonna go back to flat the way you hear it. Here comes the EQ. Back to flat. Echo India is Bravo Lima Bravo. That's just the frequency of the audio. There are a couple of usual single sideband signals that are mushy and bassy, difficult to understand. But you can add some speech articulation just by adding some 2.5 mid range. Yeah, we're flat now. The two meter, you know, a sideband, but there go two point five. Not the same as a rig built, you know, just for two meter sideband. Back to flat. You know, they, no you receivers will never, never compare. Uh, so it's kind of nice that, yeah, again, ICOM technology comes to another. They were nice enough in my county, which Mushy. was the worst, by the way, paid in the area. They they gave me five years seniority, but uh, I was flat. basically starting at the bottom. So uh, many times, people who who spend and 20 years in the, in the Navy or whatever the military is, is and retire, people say, well, you got it made. No, you don't. The next one's interesting. It's a D-104. A and a D-104, and right. certain things are fine, but a lot of times they, they're just too piercing. So we can add some bass to it. Going to leave this sure enough, I can flat. Come Here comes I the low end. The other night. I, I thought, well, I wonder if I can copy that at had about 30 words a minute, and so I speeded up the tape, and sure enough, I can copy it. And, of course, the whole thing is about balance. The whole thing is about balance. If you have an equalizer, it's all about balance. And that's so important. The guys don't, I don't know, they just, they don't think about it. They don't do it. They haven't been told. The speaker system in this is a Paul Klipsch. Uh, he would love me for this. It's his design of tuning the cavity to my five inch speaker, three and a half inch tweeter, but the amplifier is 25 watts at 0.1%. Every transceiver on the market today, from $15,000 all the way down is usually one to two watts at 10% distortion. You have never seen a spec sheet on it. They won't publish it. I work with these guys and I know that is a fact. They're terrible. And of course we think, oh, well, that's just a noise from the band. No, it's distortion and distortion drives you crazy. <laughs> and so when you clean it up, oh man. So the parametric uh, equalizer is just the way to go. And we're the only people doing this kind of thing. And I'm very, very honored by all of this. It's, uh, it's one of those things that we can help you. And you get into things like, um, I, I hate the connectors we have today. They're, they're a joke. They're Chinese Foster is the company that have been used for years. They were CP connectors. And you know what I'm talking about. The ring is a little bitty thing, only about a quarter inch. It takes needle nose to get some of them on. This one's a nice, big, fat ring. The connector's fat. I call it a stealth connector. But here's where we really win. The cable connector. You look at your matching microphone, and in about a year or so, it starts pulling out of there because it's not made for each other. I made that cable clamp to meet my specs on my cable that I designed, I'll show you in a minute. And it has two outputs. The other output is that thin wire, that's where your push to talk line. Put in your push to talk switch on a hand switch or foot switch. But that cable clamp is amazing. You can pull your car with it. And here's my wire. I have solved more RFI problems with just changing the cable. And I did that because I designed it. I knew what we needed. That's 18 gauge, not 26. And there's two of them if you have a balanced line, which a lot of transmitters do today, but the manufacturers don't know that. The shield is 100% 100 silver, really solder's good. But here's where the rubber hits the road and we go left and all these dudes are still hanging in midair. The DC of the push to talk 
is outside of that shield. The sensitive AC audio is inside, so they don't transfer the problems of the DC spikes into your audio. It's just crazy. Why are, why are they not doing that? Well, we did it. And uh, you can buy the whole thing. You take, there's several manufacturers. They buy 1,000, 10,000 foot rolls. W, uh, was it W2IHY, all of his cables. are used. Anybody that starts using it never goes back because it's really it's nice and flexible. It works great. So those are just a few things. And again, there's so many, many, many things that we could be here all night and we can't, we don't have the time. But I, I wanted to put a few things in your mind. We'll come back and focus on just one or two things. We can do that for you. I didn't get to talk about the talk box. I, I got to do a bunch of stuff on that, I guess, is what made us famous with the talk box to the rock and roll world. <laughs> But it's so wonderful. All the broadcasters today are using our microphones and they're doing it because they sound better and they work better. We're very honored. And why? Because I learned it from on radio and I learned it from listening and voicing pipe organs. So it's one of those things that I'm constantly doing new things and having a lot of fun doing it. I, uh, I was honored recently with an honorary PhD in music and electronics from Mizzou. I hardly made it through the eighth grade and I was so so honored by this because I, I, I learned it all. And like they said uh, that night when I gave the speech to the kids, uh, <laughs> I said I, I haven't had much of education and the curator and the uh, chancellor jumped up and he said, yeah, but it took you 50 years to do that and yeah i never thought about it it's really what it is and last but not least we're the only manufacturer in the rock and roll hall of fame i was very blessed by that it's the the gear that we built for pete townsend and quadrifini it was the only quad mixer built our sister company in england ies and i put this thing together and we did quadrifini and several other concerts with that wonderful equipment so that's pretty much uh, the story of what goes on here. I do hope that you learned something. I hope to come back and we could focus on just one little thing because I can talk all night on any of these great subjects that you don't hear much about. You have any questions before we get out of here? You got to have questions. Did they say question? Yeah, Bob, got questions. Yeah. So um, we have a PR40 and we really like it, but do we need a screen for it? Not really. Uh, it depends on your voice because a lot of people accept more air than others. We have a massive uh, screen inside here because in the broadcast world, they really don't want a monkey with them. A lot of them put the filters in front if you want to do that. But if you don't have any problem with it, don't worry about it. So you'll notice I've talked to you pretty much tonight and you don't hear very, very many pops. One of the other thing is how to use that microphone. You, know, you never want to talk straight into it as you hear what happens when I do that. You want to get off to the side, let that oh. ear go by. It'll still okay. pick it up and it works really good when you do that. And my second question is we also, I bought Mike a Pro Elite and uh, he bought me the traveler and i do have quite a bit of hearing loss and we are hearing aids so when we contest i take out the hearing aids and just drive the sound right in my ears should i be doing something different which one is better no the only thing i might you might take a listen to this parametric receive system i mean you can do magical things with that with the right frequencies that you need is dial them up parametric eq means you can change the parameters. You are the engineer. That really helps a lot of uh, a lot of people with hearing problems. And if you uh, have a difference less to right, you can plug the left side in and the right side in, and you can balance them. That really works great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. We met you a few times in Visalia, and you're and fabulous. Said, we, we've met before. <laughs> we've seen each other before. Yes, we have. I hate it that we're not being able to do that. Well, we saw your uh, concert in Visalia a couple of years ago at the theater yeah. there, the organ concert. That was great. Talking about one of those things. It's about oh, yeah. 20, 20 yeah. feet in front of me. <laughs> I built this new studio 
uh, we, well, we ended up in January not knowing what was coming, but uh, uh, it used to be a four-car garage for my Thunderbirds. I had a Thunderbird collection years back, but we made a great studio, and now it's a video studio and my ham radio and my Ever-11 Winterfell Theater. And, uh, nice. Really, really wonderful. I get lost out here. <laughs> I don't think you can see it, but you can see the bottom of it maybe up above me is a a loft and there's all the speakers up there for the organ but it sure sounds good and it's it's just wonderful as we designed it to, to be that way it's good to see you thank you ever, ever have a problem email me we're here for you okay uh, i have a question too bob my question is back to the rock and roll days. Um, I was always wondered how many watts of audio power those rock groups put out. We went to see the Rolling Stones a few years ago and they had these 60 foot columns with all these speakers yeah. and it curves over the audience. Yeah. How many watts of audio do they feed into those? Well, some of that gets up to be 50,000, 50, 60,000 watts. And, uh, you have to understand, though, it's it's not 50,000 right here. It has to be pointed all around the arena and real directive speakers. And each one of those speaker arrays have several thousand watts. And all together, you, you end up with 50, 60,000 watts. Bob, this is Mark, KF6WTN. Uh, quick question. You were talking about the importance of the cavity behind the microphone element. Uh -huh. uh, and I was wondering, I've seen some microphones where they're starting to use dual elements and setting the phasing between the elements. Did you want to say anything about that? I'm curious. No, because, no, because if they knew how to do it, you can do it in one. I've proven it to you here. To, to PR40, you don't need to go to all those extremities. And uh, if it's done right, and uh, we've had some pretty big leading people uh, that have tossed out all that crap and uh, this is what they're doing the PR40 has become the darling of the podcasters and the broadcasters and uh, I never built it intended for it to be ham radio but it's a <laughs> it's a huge popular microphone for ham radio also but you have to have a, a, a to really do it right you need equalization and most all the transmitters today, too, uh, do have it because I work with them. Uh, I work with Dr. Inouye for all of his, and then Dr. Has Hasegawa comes along for Yesu, and I developed the parametric EQ for everything from the 9,000 all the way through to the 101 that's got my parametric in it. And if you ever have trouble adjusting it, you go to my website. In the support page, it, there's a oh, there's about 50 pages. All things Elecraft, all things Yesu, all things Icom, so on. And and a lot of times I took pictures of how to set them and so on. But we could come back and spend a whole night on that one. And that's something that the the, uh, the manufacturers don't care. They don't think about it. They just oh, okay. Well, they'll go to book, and their books are terrible. And so we uh, we filled the gap there with our. Uh, all things, and it works great to help people. And all else fails, you got one of these things, call me. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk to you. We'll help you out. Send me an email. We'll help you out. I'll call you. Everybody done? All right. Any uh, further questions for, for Bob here? Yeah, this is uh, KK6FRK. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a, it's back to your rock and roll days, but I was born in a little town, Chinook, Kansas, home of custom yeah. electronics. And if you could comment a little bit about your top box, because when uh, those of us that were involved had aspirations to be a rock star, in the early 70s we had to have a top box what motivated you to come up with to develop that top box from in the early mid 70s okay you want the, you want the reader's digest or you want about five minutes of the entire history that started with ham radio in 19 uh, 
thirty. It, next, yeah, situate it in ham radio since that's what we do now. Thanks. Over. Yeah. Well, in 1939, there was a guy by the name of Alvino Ray. He was a great guitar player. He was W6UK. And uh, he played the guitar for the King family. And in 1939, he, uh, he married one of the King's sisters. And what he did, you remember uh, seeing, perhaps, in uh, some of the old World War uh, planes and see them in the movies these days. They couldn't have a microphone because it was too loud in the cockpit. So they had one of these things. It had little carbon elements. And they strapped it around so that they, the, your nodules, your throat nodules would modulate that microphone. Plug that into your microphone, into your transmitter. Alvino, being a ham, <laughs> He turned it backwards. He put that on his wife's throat. <laughs> and he plugged his guitar amp output into here, which excited those. And as she sang, it sounded like the guitar was singing. He was very, it was a very popular thing back in the late 30s, 39, 40. And um, that lay dormant for a number of years. Nothing ever happened other than that. 1950 comes a guy by the name of Pete Drake. He was a great guitarist player, a, a guitarist in Nashville. He had his own studio, played steel, steel guitar. And he kind of remembered that. So he took a little three inch speaker and a little bitty hose, and set it on his guitar and then put it in his mouth. And he drove the little speaker and he could kind of make it talk. Well, Joe Walsh was good friends of Dottie West and Bill West, and they had taken that box and given it to Joe to play with. Couldn't keep it, but he could play with it. And he did Rocky Mountain Way in, in the studio with it. Well, it's okay for studio work. Well, when he got out of the James Gang, he, he wanted to do his own solo, and he started Barnstorm. And one of the big numbers of that album was Rocky Mountain Way. And we're putting together Barnstorm's equipment in my plant in Marissa, Illinois. And he said, what are we going to do about that talk box thing? And I said, well, we'll just do it like we always do. We'll figure it out. And what we figured out was we built a, a box and put a 100-watt driver in it with a three-quarter inch uh, surgical tubing. And bingo, we had the Heil talk box. I didn't ever think it was going to be a big deal until, remember earlier, I told you to remember who that was in Humble Pie. It was Peter Frampton. They pulled him out as a single act in 1973 from Humble Pie. And his, he had a little girlfriend, Penny. He wrote a song, Penny, for your thoughts. And she was married in our home in Marissa. A lot of things happened like that where I had a number of roadies. We had four or five of them that actually bought homes and lived in Marissa. But they had to get a green, they had to do a green card for a while, but they had to become a citizen or get married. Well, she got married. She called me one day and she said, um, I need a Christmas present for Peter. Don't send me a guitar because he's got a bunch of them. What did I do? I sent her a talk box. I will let you write the rest of that story. <laughs> We've been friends all these many, many years. And it went on from there. My goodness, I turned on the Ellen show today. I normally don't watch I was passing by. There's Bon Jovi with high on microphones. Uh, we, uh, uh, the manager of Bon Jovi, when they first started, said, call me one day. He was a ham, by the way, their manager, Tony Bon Jovi. And we used to work him on 40 meters late night. He said, I need a hook. I need a hook for my nephew. I need one of those talk things you got. So I sent him then. 
living on a prayer. <laughs> I mean, we could be here all night talking about this because there's so many guys would come to me because it was the hook. And we were the only people that really, there were a couple of guys tried to copy it, but it, it didn't have the quality of ours because we used good old diaphragms, 100 watt drivers. They all tried to use it with little 10 watt amps and those little things built in. No, we gotta, gotta do it. <laughs> so that I think tells you the story of the great talk box. And uh, let's see, wait a minute. There's, there's my great keep seat. <laughs> it's now built by uh, Dunlop that does all of the strings and uh, picks and stuff. Uh, Jim Dunlop passed away a few years ago. His son runs it now, but they're in Benicia, California, the home of uh, several guys in the industry. But anyway, they uh, I sold them the rights in 1988, and it's built. This is a Dunlop box, by the way. They built it exactly like I designed it still being built and it's still on the market and we're very proud of that particular design of things it's helped a lot of people thanks for asking yeah thanks i remember 1976 frampton comes live in san diego uh, i was in the navy so thanks great story <laughs> well i mean there there are so many a lot of guys when i tell them this they go huh uh, that well, you don't think about it. I hear them in commercials and, uh, you know, all, all types of things like that. But uh, I also hear them uh, uh, on like with orchestras and they're doing really interesting sounds with them. And I go, wow, you guys are, you're doing some interesting things. And uh, so there again, it's, it's, it's a gadget, but it's a gadget that they can really, really make happen. So, yeah, we're really excited about some of that stuff. But it's still going on. That's the other thing. It's still happening. All right. Any other more questions for Bob? Hey, Bob. It's uh, Bob. Bob, AK six R. And uh, I remember talking to you and Art Bell and uh, Joe Walsh on eighty meters. Oh, about a year or two years right before Art Bell passed away. Are you still on 80 meters at night? Yeah. yeah. Usually on AM, though. Well, that's the only way to go. Yeah, absolutely. All absolutely. right. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's in my blood, and uh, it, it's really hard for me to get rid of it. I don't know if you can see most of this, but uh, I use an ICO. 72730, great audio out of that because it was a hi fi amp. Yep. Matrix 52080 to equalize it all. Using a Mosley receiver. I love that little Mosley. I bought that from Carl Mosley in the plant. I used to play the organ across the street from it. And of course, my wonderful central electronics that I built back in 1958 still with me. So, yeah, those, those things never, never lose. Down below over there is the Harvey Wells. So, yeah, Good. we still have fun with all that craziness. <laughs> well, I'll catch you on there. Yeah, you got it. Yep, I'm going to go fire up this guy because I got to do, we do a, a, a show every Saturday night on WTWW, uh, uh, 7 o'clock Central. Uh, that's at 200,000 watt shortwave station on 5.085. Just go to five megs on uh, WWV. You'll hear it. It's real close. It's up the band a notch. And I do a 30 minute theater organ thing there. Love to play. So we can fire that up too. <laughs> All right. One last call. That was a fantastic presentation, Bob. That was uh, very informative. Uh, loved hearing the, the stories about the, the organ and the other, uh, and all the classic rock. Oh my goodness. Fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing with us. Thank you. Well, we, uh, I, I love doing it because it's how I learned. If it wouldn't have been because of Larry Burroughs and some of those great people that taught me when I was a young kid, and I don't read it in these books, 
uh, let me point, let me grab this. I should have gotten this earlier. No matter how long you've been a ham, if you don't have this, you need to get it. Because this has all of those early things that I learned. I didn't write this. I just compiled all those notes of 60 years of my ham radio life. It's got all kinds of really cool things in it. All the dealers have it, HRO and so on and so on. But um, I, I, just, I just love sharing all of this stuff because not enough of it's being shared today, that's for sure. But uh, that's why I do all these and I do sometimes four a week and Ham Nation on Wednesday night. And then I'm doing the organ concerts too. A lot of these things, oh, I end up playing more organ than we do talking radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and you're making me of course rethink my audio setup here at home um i have like i said not one of your mics it's uh you know some chinese thing i got off ebay but i'm sitting here um almost two feet away from it uh yeah. right now but it it's hanging like on it. what's that it sounds like it well yeah See, <laughs> when you're that far away you lose transient response you lose dynamic range. Why do you think the broadcasters use PR40s and they're no more than two inches? You never want to be, never want to be more than two inches. Because when you do, listen to what happens. Listen to me. You hear the difference? You say, well, oh, yeah. Just crank up the gain. But it, 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 no, you can't do that. You lose the dynamic range. And that's in a in condenser microphones. Yep. Are He's just deciding off. What? I just asked him a couple of questions. <laughs> oh, I think Bob, yeah, Bob meant to be muted. Yeah, I, I'll have to rethink uh, where I'm placing it. It's going through a mixer. I have, um, you know, I have it sounding good enough for what I do most of the time. But uh, yeah, I'm going to have to rethink this. That's why all the podcasters, my gosh, I can't tell you. We are so busy. We've had the, the history of this last six months has been historic in our company. We've never had this kind of rush it's really been something with the pandemic because of all of us being held down but uh, now they they work from their homes and gotta have a decent microphone so we're good we're good i tell you what i'm going to do here i am going to turn this on and you can dial me out when you want how's that good enough <laughs> okay it's been wonderful guys and gals Thanks for having me. Let's do more. We can, we can do all kinds of things and really get more into some of it. But I uh, appreciate you having me. And, uh, well, I think this is a first for our club, uh, Mike. It sounds like we're going to be uh, closing the, uh, the meeting to our own concert.
By the way, uh, Bob, you're, you're down about 20 dB on your organ. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear that okay? Yeah, you were down a good 20 dB at least. Oh, well, I didn't want to blow your speakers out because it's pretty <laughs> loud here. <laughs> Very loud. Uh, well, yep, I'm going to work on some other things here. But, hey, it's been really fun. Let's uh, do it again, and we'll try to bring more subject to you. Let me know what, what, what pleases you. Thanks for having me, everybody. And we'll talk soon. 3885 yeah. where you find me. Thank, Thank you, you much. All right. For Thank us. you, Bob. That was true. See you later and all that good stuff. All right. 7 3, everybody. Seven, three, Bob, thanks. All right. 7 3, 88. <laughs> thanks Lots for being fun. here. Thank you. See you all. Reminder of next month, uh, the board elections, and see you all then. Thanks and good night. Thank you, Joe. Good night, everyone. Good night.